I am Miriam Gonzalez. I am a lawyer. I'm the author of the blog Mam and Sons and the book Made in Spain about Spanish food with bits and pieces of international food as well. And I have written the book to, to help me finance a campaign that I'm running to get female role models talking to girls all over the world. I started uh, the blog Mam and Sons because I have uh, three sons, three boys, lots of testosterone in my house, and I thought it would be a good idea to, to teach them to cook, that cooking is not only for girls, and in order to, to get them into it, I thought I would lure them with the internet. So I said, well, let's put together a blog and and you will do the pictures and we will keep it running. And we set ourselves the threshold of 60 pounds that we only reached recently after almost four years, but it, it kept them going. It's important that they learn not necessarily how to cook. I'm not so uh, focused on them learning recipes, but I think that it is important that they learn about food, about what is a good and, and a bad ingredient, how to respect the, the ingredients and when they get something really good that they try to do as little as possible to it. And also that they learn everything else that comes around the food, the, the sitting together with the families and friends <laughs> at the table to, to talk about things as you are cooking. I think it's, it's all that that is really important for them to learn. We cook from scratch all the time <laughs> and we sit together whenever we are all together. So if I'm working late or Nick is working late, they may uh, eat on their own during the week, but uh, definitely every weekend and during the week whenever we can as well. But I think that it is happening more and more all around the world, but definitely Spain is a culture that is very much focused on, on food. When we wake up, we talk about what we are going to have for lunch, and at lunch we talk about what we are going to have for dinner, and, and food is a real subject of, of conversation. And, and I, you know, I vividly remember from my childhood all those, all those memories about everybody sitting together, or my grandmother cooking, and everybody else around in the, in the kitchen. And in a way, I think it is that that conforms your life, really, all those little moments you know, with the ones you love. Oh, the recipes are for myself. I cook because I like eating, really. <laughs> well, there are a few recipes in the, in the food that um, come from my grandmother. My maternal grandmother was a really good cook and she cooked with, with love. So you knew from the moment you went into the house and you smelled what she had prepared, you knew whether you were high up there or, or down because if you were the favorite, you know, she would have prepared for you what you really likes and, and there is a recipe for stewed lamb and also um, chicken with apple that is very much the kind of things that she would cook and, and whenever we prepare it, it just reminds me of her. I don't think that the authenticity um, in the sense of keeping the recipe as it was traditionally uh, is so important. At the end of the day, all of us, we get recipes and we, we adapt them as we go. And I myself have picked up quite a few international recipes and you just, I'm sure that I, I make them kind of Spanish-like by putting them together with my own cooking traditions. In the, in the case of um, Jamie, I think that he is so wonderful. He is one of these persons that you know, not only he's a wonderful cook, he's just a fantastic campaigner, he's a tireless campaigner. He has been going at campaigns for years and years without getting tired. So if there is somebody that in Spain we are going to allow them to put chorizo in the paella, that should be Jamie. It's not so much that the UK gets tapas wrong, it's simply that it means something different here and in Spain. In Spain, going for tapas is you go, you dress up, first of all, because it's quite important <laughs> how you look, and then you just go to a little place, you have a bite to eat, with a, probably you start with a very small 
a glass of beer and then you move somewhere else and you have another little glass of beer with uh, something else, with some calamari, for example, and then you go to a third bar and you have um, some croquetas and then perhaps you move onto, onto wine and you keep going to four, five, six probably different places. You are talking to lots of different people as you come and, and go and it's a truly social occasion. It is quite difficult to do that in the UK, first of all, because you don't have all that variety of places, so you would have to move a considerable distance to do that, and also because of the weather. So in Spain you can do that in a way, because it doesn't matter whether you are eating inside or, or outside. The Spain of my childhood is very, very different to the, to the Spain of, of today. And I uh, normally use it as an example when people say, oh, well, it will take generations to change. Well, it doesn't really, because what I have seen in my own country is that from how things were 30 years ago to how things are now is, is like a complete different universe. We have had a full gender parity government in Spain. I mean, there, there are things that I see in other countries that simply would not be allowed, uh, that they are published um, in Spain. It's a real issue. Many women um, work and they don't see that as, as something that they have to, to justify um, towards society. So I think that in, in a way, there is very little difference now between countries in north of Europe, including the UK, and what is happening in countries like Italy, um, or Spain. And, and probably what we see is rather that the countries that have come much later to the access of women to the, to the workplace and the liberation of women, so to speak, they feel now stronger about it <laughs> than countries where that happened earlier and they have gone a little bit around and it has come to a more natural curve that women feel that they can choose whatever they want, whether it is to, to continue pushing for those rights or kind of retreat if that is what they want um, themselves. You asked me about Piropos. Piropos is a very Spanish thing. It's, it's not necessarily wolf whistling, but um, it's kind of comments that they may make to you. And more or less, um, they tend to have a, a funny edge to them. They can be um, said to you with respect or without um, respect. Obviously, without respect is completely unacceptable, but what I have found is that the attitude towards Piropos tend to change with your age. So there comes an age when we women tend to become invisible, and when you are not invisible, you say, oh yeah, well, I exist. <laughs> Well, I don't have any issues really about keeping my, um, my feminist views and Nick's uh, feminist views while he was in power. And probably because, because we both agreed and also because he was the leader of the Liberal Party where many of the things that other wives of leaders had to do were not really so expected. So whenever I put um, together with Nick really the red lights as to what um, what I would do and what I would not do, and I was always very much of the view that I would agree to do certain things provided they would not touch my children. <laughs> the, even within those things I had some boundaries and, and to be fair to the whole Liberal Party they all, they all accepted it. But it is certainly true that in politics um, uh, wives and female partners are still expected to do a whole range of things that, that husbands are not expected to do. I'm very happy to say that that seems to be changing, that um, there is much less now of the kisses in the podium, in the conferences. I, I hope that that is a sign of the, of the time. And, and yes, definitely I don't, I don't believe that the husband of Theresa May will be doing a lot of flower arrangements, but perhaps I'm wrong, and he will. <laughs> I entertain, I entertain, I have entertained during politics and I have entertained in the post-government period. I, it really depends on the face and what is happening on the family, in the family and, and how much work we may have at different times. But I generally like, I like sharing, I like um, having people around. When they come around, I, I believe that when they come to your house, you are in charge of their happiness. So you, 
you are meant to make an effort. And that doesn't really mean, you know, you can do that with humble ingredients, you can do it with um, cheap food. It doesn't need to be hyper sophisticated. It's just about the care. And if you care, magic happens and you'll have a good time. Well, it could be, it's very simple, it could be my family and my friends. <laughs> I cannot think of my dream uh, dinner party could be my family and friends. I never have uh, as good a time as when I'm surrounded by those I love and who love me. And, um, and the dinner would probably be simple as well. It would definitely start with ham and, um, and there would be good Ribera del Duero wine around. I can tell you my view about that. I, I, was, um, I was subject to um, questions about what I may have said or I may not have said about um, helmet mayonnaise. It's, I was completely baffled about it because actually if you read my book, <laughs> I don't think that I say anything about being surprised or whatever. Um, um, I think some even put it stronger than that about going to that lunch. It was just a funny situation where we both ended up <laughs> having lunch because it was considered that the wife had to, had, had to meet. And, and there is a serious side to, to all that story because um, it all started with mischief from the editor of the Daily Mail uh, yet again. But it was picked up by others without bothering to, to read the book. And listen, this is just food, I mean, who cares? It's just mayonnaise, even I don't care and I'm the author of the recipe. But I think that when it comes to politics, it does matter. I think that the way in which uh, the right-wing media distorts and creates mischief, and then those who are not part of the right-wing media pick up the story and reproduce it and they, they parrot it, it has had a really, really detrimental effect in politics in this country, as we are seeing right now. Um, listen, Brexit, I was in favour of um, Remain. I think that it is sad that the country has decided to disengage from the um, European Union. I think that um, um, we are seeing already the beginnings of the, the economic, uh, economic concerns about it, but um, I feel that it's even more worrying at the international political level and, and what this means for the, for the international order. I believe that Brexit, in a way, is the least important thing that happened um, this year because Brexit is the symptom of something else that is happening in the country which is a very clear move towards the right wing and we are seeing that now um, crystallizing into some proposals in relation to, to foreigners, whether it's foreign, foreign workers, whether it's today it's about foreign investment and People may have voted for Brexit, but I don't think that anybody at the time of the vote voted for having foreigners listed in companies, for uh, putting any obstacles to foreign investment. And I think that the Prime Minister should have the courage <laughs> to explain that these are her own ideas and stop hiding behind people. I have to say that I feel myself a citizen of the world, so that kind of person that has been put down by the Prime Minister as a citizen of nowhere. And I, as I hope that anybody who reads my book will see, you can be a citizen of the world and you can have seriously strong roots um, as well. In a way, what I hope that every girl understands in inspiring women and inspiring girls, the campaigns that I run, is that you have to go through the world with your antenna zone and being citizens of the world and understanding the world is what the next generation is about. Sparing Women is a campaign that I launched three and a half, almost four years ago, and it is a very simple idea. It's about bringing women, all sorts of women, from all walks of life, all young, senior, junior, working, non-working, working, working part-time, 
back to schools to spend some time with girls 13, 14 years old. We are targeting in the, in the UK. We have been really successful. We have more than 26,000 women all throughout the country spending time with the girls. And, and you just go there to school with a group and you explain who you are, <laughs> what you do, your ups, your downs. And, and you make the girls see how many different models and options there are in life uh, for them. Many of them want to talk about self-confidence. Self-confidence is a real issue for girls actually all around the world. We have launched it uh, also in China. We are about to launch it in Serbia, then in Italy, in Spain, um, Zambia. We are internationalizing it. It will become slightly different. We are calling it inspiring girls um, in this global uh, format and we are partnering with organizations like the UN and UNESCO so I, I really feel that we can have a, a proper pickup and it's all because we only ask for one hour per year per woman so you really would have to be a very very bad person not to want to do that. <laughs> Well, croquetas, um, croquetas take a long time to prepare. You really have to have a free afternoon to, and to love your family a lot to prepare croquetas for, for them. And I'm very impatient, so I, I rarely ever prepare them, um, nor does my mother. I have two aunts that really compete for making the very best, best um, croquetas. Uh, but when Nick goes to Spain, it's quite hilarious. No matter what uh, he's talking about, whether he was talking about Europe or about whatever economic poli policy, there would be a question at the end about, do you really love Spanish food? Because we are really very attached <laughs> to our food. And, and somehow it became a myth that he loved my mother's croquetas, which is hilarious because she hasn't made croquetas for, I think, like probably 40 or 50 years. Um, but yes, yeah, she's really happy now that people ask her in the street, like, oh, so I hear that you have a really good recipe for croquetas. So speaking of croquetas, <laughs> um, I made these from your book, um, which they are quite fiddly, aren't they? They are very so fiddly, Definitely yeah. a knack to them, but um, yeah, delicious. It's probably the most difficult recipe there yeah. is, because you cannot, you cannot make... It's too tough. Mm -hmm. If you make it too tough, then the flavor would not be very good. So you really need to get the practice um, to, to roll them. Um, but there comes a point that you can roll them properly and as you fry them, it melts inside. Right. And that's when you have a good croquette. So you need to keep going. I will, I will <laughs> keep going. And I love the fact that you can make them in advance and then just chuck them in the freezer and freezer, look like yeah. an amazing goddess when people come around. Yeah, it's actually better um, to fry them from the freezer yeah. so that they don't lose their, their shape. And, and generally in Spain, we do it with very fine breadcrumbs that helps not to get rough edges. I see. Well, now I know. I'll carry on. I'll <laughs> keep practicing. <laughs> yeah. um, and this was your grandmother's recipe yes, as well, yes. the chicken and exactly. apple, which is, um, nobody can get that wrong, I don't think. It's yes, incredibly exactly. simple. It's very simple, so. yeah. It's a simple ingredient. It's kind of farm food um, in Spain. It's a, it's a nice combination because it has the, a little bit of vinegar and then the sweetness mm. um, of the apple. So it balances each other very well and it doesn't really hide the flavor of the chicken so it's there is a bit of contrast there but not not too powerful yeah. it works very well Quite. and also you can make it in advance yes and it's better for the next day i made that last <laughs> night so yes. definitely be yeah, ready for the, the juice that's one of your favorite ones for that is one of parties. my favorites yes and i think that is so easy you mm. serve something like this with either potatoes or rice and mm -hmm. you know, what can go wrong nothing it's really lovely good um, and finally, I made the olive oil cake. Yeah, that's good, yes. Which, um, <laughs> yeah, no butter in there. Right, like, we yes. would probably use butter um, yeah. in baking, but um, yeah. the Spanish we, we, feel strongly yeah. about olive oil, I we guess. We do olive oil for everything, from getting rid of makeup to frying um, sweets, everything. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is nice olive oil, because it's, uh, olive oil cake because it's, it's moist, but not, not too wet. It has pine nuts because mm -hmm. where I come from is the, one of the main areas that produces pine nuts oh, right. um, and exports them uh, everywhere. So that, that was 
a bit of my addition, really. <laughs> I made that with my um, two-year-old, and he loved, he loved oh, great. making it. Oh, yeah. great. Good that you're cooking with yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Miriam, for talking to the pool today. We've, we've loved trying your recipes. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you for giving me the time to talk to you. <laughs>